Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. We've covered a lot of territory with the algebra of Boole, going from logic, gates, circuit analysis, all the way to propositional logic. I want to kind of complete the circle by going back to the very first topics that we talked about, which is the birth of logic in ancient Greece at the hands of Aristotle and his syllogisms. So I want to have another look at Aristotle's syllogisms from the point of view of the algebra of Boole that we are now comfortable with. In fact, this is a very uh, important connection with Boole's original thinking because that was really his primary motivation in setting up his algebra in the first place. He was interested in making contact and explaining classical philosophical logic, which at that time was more or less Aristotle and works built upon Aristotle. So in the the book, The Mathematical Analysis of Logic, being an essay towards a calculus of deductive reasoning that he wrote in 1847. You can actually find this work uh, on the internet with uh, Project Gutenberg. And if you have a look at it, you will see that in Greek, at, uh, at the very front, at the initial title page, there's actually a quote by Aristotle. So that emphasizes the importance that Boole gave to this classical sort of application of his work. Now I might just make a, a note that if you do have a look at Boole's work, you might see that it's a little bit different from the way I'm presenting it. And one of the big differences is that he tends to use minus signs a lot. So like he, he might write x minus 1 or 1 minus x. But for us, that's the same as x plus 1. Okay, so because mod 2 minus 1 is the same as plus 1, so it's really the same. That's just a, a little hint to make translation of what he's doing to what we're doing a little bit easier. So today what I want to do is I want to go back to the Aristotelian syllogisms and have a fresh look at them with our new understanding of propositional logic viewed from the eyes of the algebra of Boole. Aristotle's syllogisms rest on four fundamental logical forms, which are ways of combining pairs of elementary propositions. And they are indicated by these little vowels, A, E, I, and O. So let me remind you about basically how we started this little course, that A, little a, b, so referencing two propositions, capital A and capital B. This is a short form for every B is an A. Okay, that's not exactly the way Aristotle would have said it, but that's sort of a modern interpretation of what he's talking about. And in terms of um, vectors in a Boole algebra that represent these properties or propositions A and B, we could rewrite this in this algebraic form, that it's b times 1 plus a equals 0. The second one has an e in it, and it stands for no b is an a. So a little e b means no b is an a, and algebraically in the algebra Boole, that's corresponding to the corresponding propositions here, or vectors, a, b, the product is 0. And then there's i, look, a, i, b means some b is an a. And that's kind of the opposite of this one. So it's represented by a, b does not equal zero. And a little o, b is some b is not an a, sort of the opposite of this one. And so that's given by b times one plus a does not equal zero. And the form of the syllogisms, they have roughly always the same form. There are two premises and then a conclusion. So, for example, the syllogism whose name is Celerant has the following form. That AEB together with BAC implies AEC. So if we interpreted this in English, the E would be no B is an A. So we're assuming no B is an A. And this one here, we're assuming that every C is a B. From those two premises, we should be able to conclude A, E, C, which is this one here. No C is an A. So if no B is an A, but every C is a B, then no C is an A. That's one of his syllogisms. 
And let me also remind you about how we're thinking about the propositions relating to these abstract vectors in a Boole algebra. So we'll also go back to one of the early examples where we had five beings or five people or creatures, that's our sort of our population, and then we had various properties of these creatures. And the properties were being human, being a god, being athletic, being uh, was it maybe novel, and being keen. Okay, so what do these vectors mean? So the vectors just record which of the elements in the population have which properties. So this vector for H, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, means that A1 is a human, A2 is a human, A3 is a human, A4 is a human, and A5 is not a human. Okay, so they are the vectors that we're actually working with mathematically. Okay, so from the algebra of Boole point of view, what we do is we dispense with the population, we dispense with the, the actual meanings or the fussing about, you know, the English words for these, the defining aspects of these things. And we just think about these vectors. So this is a vector H, this is a vector G, this is a vector A, and so on. And we do algebra with these vectors. Now, in the algebra of Boole, there's basically three things that we can do. We can multiply two vectors, like h times g, and the multiplication is just a mod 2 operation. 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 1 is 1, and 1 times 0 and 0 times 1 are all zeros. We can add them, and the addition is also a mod 2 operation. So h plus g is we're adding, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is crucially 0 because this is a mod 2 operation and these guys here are also 1's. The other thing that we can do, say to A, is to simply add 1. So 1 plus A, it's like the negation of A. Instead of having 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, we have 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And that's the framework in which the algebra of Boole kind of works. So. That's what we're doing when we're applying the algebra book. We're reducing everything to basically these operations and making all our calculations in this, in this domain. Now, with propositional logic, we had more connectives. So we still have uh, this one here, the product, but that's sort of like K and A. Okay? But in addition to that, we have K or A. So K or A, here's K and A. So K or A would be 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. This is a, an inclusive OR as opposed to this one, which is an exclusive OR. We have the implication. G implies N. Here's G, here's N. Does 0 imply 0? Well, that's maybe not the right way of saying it. We should say, what is 0 implies 0? By definition, 0 implies 0 is 1. 0 implies 1 is 1. 1 implies 0 is 0. 0 implies 0 is 1. 1 implies 1 is 1. So the only time an implication is 0 is in something like this when you have 1 implies 0. 1 implies 0 equals 0. Otherwise, it equals 1. And then we have the equivalence, so H and A. Equivalence just telling us whether they're equal or not. These are equal, we get a 1. These are not. Get a zero, these are equal, get a one, these are not, get a zero, these are equal, get a one. And instead of negating in this fashion, classically, we use this symbol for negation, so not k is just the opposites of k. And then we have these two special elements that are deserving of perhaps their own kind of names. The zero vector is consisting of all zeros, and the one vector is consisting of all ones. And we're kind of seeing this one here already here because what we're really doing here is we're really adding the one vector to a when we when we write down one plus a. Okay, now we have this alternate or different framework, which going back to Aristotle, the Aristotelian syllogisms, where we have expressions like maybe k e g. What does that mean? It means no g is a k. Here's G, here's K. Gods are keen, or maybe they're not keen. So no God is keen. Okay, so 
our interpretation of that is that if you take the product g times k in each case you get zero okay another way of saying that sometimes it's more convenient to think about it in terms of when it is equal to one it's equal to one if we add one so one plus kg equals one so one plus kg is always true interpretation of false and true while kg is always false Okay, so we have these different frameworks, and we're now trying to connect the Aristotelian syllogism story with the algebra of Boole directly, sort of finessing the propositional logic. So it turns out, a little bit surprisingly, that applying the algebra of Boole to Aristotle's syllogisms is not entirely straightforward. There's a bit of a snag. And that was really recognized by Aristotle in a way, and it was certainly also recognized by Boole. And the, the snag has to do with the fact that two of Aristotle's fundamental forms are importantly different from the other two. Okay, so we're going to say that the first two are perfect logical forms. This is following somewhat Aristotle's terminology. Okay, so the forms a little a b and a little e b every b is an a and no b is an a these two forms have a crucially different character from the other two the ones involving i and o okay so let's have a look at these two and let's just look at them again from the algebra of Boole point of view so every b is an a in terms of vectors little a and little b uh, this is one way of saying it, b times 1 plus a equals 0 that we've already seen. We could also rewrite this, expand it out and add 1 to both sides and express it this way. It's 1 plus b plus a b equals 1. When we do that, we see that this left-hand side is really just b implies a. b implies a is 1 plus the first term plus the product. So this is really equivalent to the expression b implies a equaling 1. Okay, so that's the statement that, that b implies a is true, or it's a tautology, it's always, it's always 1. Now we might write that in propositional logic language as just the statement that capital B implies capital A. So that's a way of taking Aristotle's form with this little a and converting it into something which is more readily recognizable in the propositional logic world. Okay, so this, this premise is really just the same as the premise that b implies a. And what about this one, a little e b? So that means no b is an a. And we've seen that's given algebraically by a b equals 1. And we could similarly kind of massage that by adding 1 to both sides to get 1 plus a b equals 1. Now it's in the form where it's like a, a statement which we're assuming to be true. Okay, the 1 here is constant 1, it's a tautology. So this is a tautology. It's really the same as the premise that not a b. Right? This is a b. The adding 1 is in the propositional logic world the same as taking the not. So we can reconfigure this kind of logical form as not a b in the propositional logic framework. Okay. So that's good. And but it turns out that the other two are more problematic in this direction. Okay, so we'll have to talk about them later. We're gonna now focus on on these two and the syllogisms that kind of involve them. Now these days Aristotle's syllogisms are not really much studied outside of philosophy courses. Uh, they are of course a great historical interest but they don't really apply directly to applications like, uh, like electronics and such. Uh, but still it's uh, really interesting to have a look at these things again. So let's have a look at uh, some of the syllogisms and I remind you that there are kind of several families of them. Uh, certain figures, okay, like first figure syllogisms, second figure syllogisms, third figure syllogisms, and so on. And those are categorized by the, uh, the nature or the form of the premises that we take. So here the, 
the premises, there's always two premises, they have a kind of a common element uh, here and here, here and here, here and here and here and here. Um, over here, uh, the common element is the first one, A's, 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 A's. Okay? And there's also third figure ones. And here are the names of Aristotle's classical syllogisms sort of categorized in terms of first figure and second figure. So we have Barbara, Celerant, Dari, and Ferio, and here they are here. And then in the second figure ones, we have Cesare, Camestris, Festino, and Barocco, and here they are here. And we're going to concentrate on those ones which just involve these sort of perfect logical forms of A's and E's. Okay, which are those? They are these two right here, Barbara and Celerant, only involving A's and E's. These two involve I's and O's. Similarly, down here in the second figure, the first two, Cesare and Camestres, are perfect. We'll call them perfect. Uh, they only involve these A's and E's, but not the slightly more complicated I's and O's. Okay? And it turns out that in the third figure ones, there are none that are perfect. So, in Aristotle's list, there are really only these four perfect ones that involve only these logical forms that are directly translatable to classical propositional logic. So earlier in this course, I actually gave you proofs of some of these uh, syllogisms. And at that time, the proofs involved, well, they weren't that complicated, but they involved a little bit of cleverness. You had to look at things in the right way and then make the right kinds of little algebraic substitutions or whatever. I want to now have a look at this same story again with this larger point of view of the algebra boule, especially with our emphasis on systematic reasoning. So I want to divorce the discussion from any kind of cleverness. I want to remove cleverness. Okay? I want to replace it rather with an algorithmic systematic procedure that you could encode on your computer and that is then pretty well cut and dried. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do that. So let's have a look at Barbara. Here is Barbara, A little a, B, B little a, C, A little a, C. If every B is an A and every C is a B, then every C is an A. Okay, now what we are going to do is we're going to take those two kinds of forms, the A's and the E forms, and convert them into propositional logic statements as I've just showed you. So a little a b is converted to b implies a. This one here is converted into c implies b, and this one is converted into c implies a. And then the form of this is that we have these two as the premises, and this is the conclusion. Now what that amounts to is taking the product of these two and forming this composite expression involving this product implies the conclusion. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify this and reduce it and hopefully get one, showing that it's a tautology. And if it's a tautology, it means that whenever this is one, then this has to be one. That's the crucial thing about the implications, that if the left-hand side is one, then the right-hand side has got to be one if the final evaluation is one. That's sort of what we're doing. We're taking these premises. So we're assuming this is true, or in the algebra of Boole, we're assuming it's equal to 1. We're assuming this is true, we're assuming this is equal to 1. And we're deducing, therefore, that this is also equal to 1. And the way we're doing that is we're taking this composite thing and just evaluating it. Okay? So the evaluation means that we don't have to do anything clever. We're just doing something automatic. We can get our grade 9 student friend to help us and do it for us. Okay, so we convert everything to the algebra pool. B implies A is 1 plus B plus AB. C implies B is 1 plus C plus BC. C implies A is 1 plus C plus AC. We simplify this thing here. We get 1 plus B plus C plus AB plus BC. So now it becomes all of this implies this. And then we know how this implication expands. It's 1 plus the first term plus the product of the first term and the second term. And then you 
multiply that out. In this case, it's convenient to observe that this term here cancels exactly with this times one. So it's actually much simpler than it looks. And you get one. Let's circle that. Okay, one, that's what we want. As a Boole poly number, this thing here is equal to one, and that proves Barbara. Now, Barbara, you will probably recognize, it's really just the same as what we formerly called hypothetical syllogism. If B implies A and C implies B, then C implies A. Okay, well, Aristotle was there first. So. This is a completely cut and dried proof of this syllogism. It doesn't require any kind of clever insight or, or even any decision making. We're just expanding and simplifying. Okay, the next one on our list of four perfect syllogisms is celerant. A little a b, b little a c implies a little e c. So this one here, no b is an a, is represented algebraically by 1 plus a b. Assuming this is true is equivalent to assuming this is equal to 1. Here's an implication, c implies b, and our conclusion is another e thing. It's uh, no c is an a, or 1 plus a c. Okay, we convert everything to algebra rules, so we replace this implication with 1 plus c plus b c. We expand this thing out here, we get 1 plus c plus a b plus b c, and then this implication becomes 1 plus the first term plus the product. We simplify that in exactly the same kind of way we just did, and we get 1. That proves celerant. Okay, here is Cesare, which has this form, and then Similarly, we replace these things. This is 1 plus AB. This is C implies A. This is 1 plus BC. We do exactly the same thing as before. We replace this thing with what it's equal to. We expand this out. We replace it like this. We simplify. We get 1. Completely cut and dried. Okay, and the last one of our four perfect syllogisms is chemestres. Every B is an A. No C is an A implies no C is a B. There's algebraic forms for those various things. We've expanded this one here, and we expand it and simplify it. We get this, we write it out in the usual way, one plus the first term plus the product, and then we simplify this thing here, and we get one. So that's the proof of chemistries. So this is good. It's good in the sense that we now have a completely algorithmic way of proving the syllogisms, but only four of them in Aristotle's list, okay? So even in the first, second, and third syllogisms, there's actually 14 of them altogether. So we're missing quite a, uh, a few, all right? So there's a very natural question. What about the other forms? The other forms involving those symbols I and O. And crucially in the English formulation, the, the meanings of some B is an A, or some B is not an A. Some, instead of, you know, all. Well, that's a really interesting question. And I think that's something that modern logic hasn't quite gotten on top of. Okay? George Boole certainly understood the challenge here, and he tried to surmount it in a way that, you know, it's laudable, but maybe it wasn't as convincing as it could have been. Certainly not maybe as arithmetical as what I've just been showing you now. So it naturally leads us to a question of, do we need to enlarge the algebra of Boole a little bit? Do we need to have a bigger sort of framework that deals with these other syllogisms? Now, if you're an electrical engineer, you say, well, I don't care about these other syllogisms because they don't come up in practice in logical circuits. Now, maybe they say that. I don't know if you're an engineer. Maybe you say that, maybe you don't. Maybe there are some situations where, in fact, this kind of thing does appear in engineering. I don't really know. But in any case, um, it's certainly not of paramount modern importance, it would seem. But it seems to me, from a logical point of view, and sort of a, a sense of completeness, we really should go back to Aristotle, who set up the subject uh, to begin with, and really look more carefully to see if we can mathematize what he's doing with these other syllogisms. So this is a challenge, and I want to talk about this challenge in our next video. 
I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.